For me, one of my favorites, I'm from Philadelphia, and I went to the University of Pennsylvania, even though I teach at Harvard both in the business school and the design school. Um, and on Logan Square, which is a traditional square, uh, it looks like the Place de la Concorde. Uh, there are two buildings that are replicas of that. A very classical place. We designed a Four Seasons Hotel and major office building. It was the first project to be approved there, uh, and many great architects tried to get buildings approved, but we did one they actually felt really worked. It was modern in a way, but still very much uh, related to the classical. Uh, General Ree, which I spoke to you about earlier, this was the one that uh, we got selected for, and uh, that building looks as good today. One of the things that we pride ourselves in, the quality of detail, and that the buildings will look as well today as they did 20 years ago, 25 years ago. If you go to 333 Riker Drive today, it's almost 30 years old now, it looks as good as it was when we built it. Same with this building, because I have a place in Connecticut, I go by this, and it uh, always looks great. Procter & Gamble, as we spoke about, uh, this was the addition, and uh, we were, this was one of the first buildings we worked in open plan, and we had to convince for the management, all of the uh, senior officers to move from private offices to uh, uh, open plan. This project in Chicago was our first venture uh, with a large-scale mixed-use project. In Asia today, almost every project is mixed-use. And what I mean by that is you can have uh, retail, hotel servicing or mall rooms, meeting room, office space, hotel rooms, and apartments all in one structure. Steel and concrete, it varies. It's a steel structure to here, and then it becomes concrete above, so that intersection is quite interesting. The elevator and the lobbies and the security are all serious problems one has to deal with when you do these large buildings. This was 70-some stories tall, over 2 million square feet, and very successful, and Four Seasons is the operator. All right, some of our ABC work, I just keep you up to date. This was the last building. What is interesting is this building, it was the first one I showed you a while back, and this was the last. <laughs> Went all the way around the street, though, in the meantime, doing this. So it was kind of a fun thing to do a whole city block in New York over time. This picture was supposed to be on the cover of the New York Times magazine section, and it was supplanted by, unfortunately, the death of the astronauts, that first disaster uh, back in the 80s. But uh, this is Shelley, Bill, and myself, and a building we had proposed in New York over Grand, near Grand Central using the air rights. Um, okay, 1985. In 1985, I attended a ULI, Urban Land Institute meeting, and an economist was speaking, and he said to the audience, if you're not global, by 1990, half of you will be out of business. And I swear he was talking to me. So I went back to my party and said, guys, we've got to start to expand. We're strictly a U.S.-Canadian-based company. We've got to go overseas. And they were less interested than I was, but I realized we had to do this. So a good friend of mine that Al knows, Claude Ballard, was at Goldman Sachs then, and Al told me today that he got him his job at Goldman, and so he did me a big favor because Claude was a good friend and recommended us to do Goldman Sachs, London headquarters. So before the decade was over, we were working in London on Goldman Sachs, which I'll show you later. This is Bill Louie. Oh, these are all partners. Uh, Pat's retired, unfortunately, Shelley passed away with brain, brain cancer, but um, great guy. And this was Goldman Sachs in London, in the oldest part of London, with the oldest bar in London, back in here. Um, we had, these are all landmark buildings, had to be saved, and they became the entrance to Goldman. Uh, you can tell it's an investment bank by the car, um, <laughs> to the courtyard at this point, and then uh, we try to reflect light from above down into the courtyard when it was sunny in London. We're now studying expansion for Goldman in this area. Uh, and then this was the other. We got invited to a competition in, in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, in the same time frame. And we did the competition, and we beat out, I remember, some of the German architects who never forgave us, one being Klaus. And, uh, but it's a phenomenal building in Frankfurt that's led to other work that we've done. In Frankfurt, is in many countries, in many, um, sorry, um, Oh, can't get the, oh, there we go. In Frankfurt, as in many places, you have to provide housing as part of any office building. Now, either you have to have a separate site or you make it part. So this, this piece of the building has housing and the rest is office. Okay. Uh, and you have to provide community facilities, which this 
atrium has restaurant shops uh, and it's open 24 hours for the community. Now, Asia. In Chicago, we were working for uh, a, a, a large company called Taisei. Japanese, Japanese have construction companies that are more than construction companies. They're architects, engineers, builders, developers. They're thousands of people. Taisei is one of the five. And they were working with us in Chicago. They liked us. They took us to Tokyo to uh, compete for a project. The project never went ahead, so they felt badly. They recommended we be interviewed by the Japanese railroad, JR Tokai, which runs the Shinkansen, the bullet trains from Tokyo to Osaka. And this little project of five million square feet was our introduction into Asia, our first building. So can you imagine? Um, and uh, a mega structure beyond belief. Um, sorry, I keep uh, missing that. Um, this is all retail. Only in places like Asia can you have 17 floors, Al, of retail. <laughs> 17. Sky Lobby, where it's connected to the office building and the hotel, great restaurants, etc. This building is totally full, even though the Japanese, when we started in Japan, the economy was at the height, they were the power. But 10 years later, they really sunk. But this building did extremely well. This is the Sky Street where everybody comes and looks out over Nagoya, which is home of, uh, of car making. And the uh, public loves this building. At the same time, we were working in, uh, in Bo we got selected by IBM to do their headquarters in Montreal. And this one, uh, the top I don't know, building in Canada for the 25-year award, that, I once stood there, I, I kid you not, but the, the pool was empty, so I didn't jump. But uh, <laughs> it's... Uh, Quite a dramatic building. We also were doing, uh, sorry, we were doing other buildings in the U.S. at that time. We got selected for the Federal Reserve Bank, which was a lot of fun because of the security, the vaults, below grade, everything automated. And uh, it's a very beautiful building in Dallas. It's not too far away from all their cultural facilities. And then in an international competition, we won the World Bank, which was 2 million square feet. And we had 13 floors and 130 feet by a very unique structure of mechanical systems and won the competition. And we had a very modern building in the city at that time where classical architecture seemed appropriate, but not for the foreign nations who regard as colonialism. Anyway, this great space, this atrium, is spectacular. And all the European countries wanted to be on the atrium at the outside. And uh, this place, if you're by yourself, this great space, which is a 150-foot cube, feels fantastic. But it is just as fantastic with a great dinner party. So um, that was actually the American Institute of Architects having a dinner party there. OK, IBM. Uh, in the class today, I use this as a case study. But IBM, uh, in 1992, was on its way really precipitously down. It had fired. 135,000 people. It had written off $6 billion in debt, and it had, uh, its stock had dropped to an all-time low. Lou Gerstner came in as chairman of, or CEO of IBM, and he decided to build a new headquarters, even though they had a very large headquarters, because he felt the building had to change the culture of IBM. All, back then, all the IBMers had their own offices, own conference rooms, wide corridors, they didn't see or talk to each other. He changed all of that, even changed the blue suit, white shirt syndrome. And his idea of leadership was quite amazing. And he remade IBM, and this building evolved with all open plan and people actually communicating with each other. And he wanted a high-tech building in nature. But he's a very interesting guy. He said, you know, he said, Gene said, personally, I want a classical building. But that's the worst thing for IBM. IBM is a great technical company. It needs to be modern. Now, there are not too many CEOs who let their personal taste get buried in, in favor of the company. But he did. He was quite amazing. Uh, I won't go through all that. But that's the typical workstation. The average s space was 75 square feet per person. But in this gorgeous site, they sat out looking at nature, both from within and outside. And um, now. Having flown all the time to all our meetings, Bill and I were in an airport one day. He said, you know, we really ought to pursue airports. I mean, God, I mean we know airports better than anybody. We're in them all the time. And uh, the first one that came up was Buffalo. Uh, the word international is a bit of a joke. It just goes into Canada, I think. But nevertheless, um, 
they wanted to build a new airport, and we teamed up with a Buffalo firm and an airport firm so that we could learn how to do airports. So from a marketing point of view, if you don't have expertise in a building type and you want to change, because you really need to team up with architects who've done that. You begin to learn their trade, and then you can do it. And that's what we did here. We got selected for this, and as a result of this airport, we've been doing airports around the world, and I'll show you one other. But we were the designers, but we had an airport expert and a local firm, and politically were set up properly. So you have to think about all those things when you pursue work. It's not just that you're great guys or gals and have a terrific reputation. You really have to think about the client, what they're looking for, and how your team and your approach uh, works. I thought that, that you, you go through the tail of the plane to get into the, no, security. Okay. We said one thing was to, to begin to diversify geographically. So up until now, we've gone to Europe and Japan. But the other thing was to change from office buildings to other uses. You saw the airport, schools became important. And we got commissioned to do one of the great schools in New York where the entire university is in two buildings. And this is one of them, Baruch College. And there are four or five different schools within that building. And you'll see the whole concept was a series of atriums connected with sun that moves through this building. And you go to different schools depending where that you land in the atrium. And uh, real quickly, some great shots of that space. Very successful school. So these are different levels uh, within that. You have you know, sociology, you might have business, you have, and they have great athletic facilities below grade. At the same time now, we began to move more in Asia. I'm trying to show how the firm is thinking, because it's not just linear that you, know, you go from this project to this. We are starting to now pursue work in many countries at the same time. And we recognized that China was going to be one of the great places for potential work. And our first project in China was this one uh, called Plaza 66, which has been one of the most successful. And I think Al or your son said this was the best retail in China was in this building. So, uh, and some of that retail mall here. We began doing work in Hong Kong for Hong Kong land. And that included redoing existing buildings to improve the, both the retail both interior and exterior, as well as redoing buildings on the exterior and adding new ones. So it's a total redo over a number of years. Uh, and then uh, this Mandarin is the highest quality Mandarin of the Mandarins. It's in landmark in Hong Kong. Recommended if you go there. Meanwhile, in London, we're now getting new commissions. And we end up with a building called Thames Court. Now, this is kind of interesting. You know, in New York, you can build pretty high in most sites. And you're governed by setbacks of zoning or by area. In London, you can't. You're governed by St. Paul's. The view corridor is to St. Paul. So you have to be able to see that. So that view corridor comes across that roof and comes across the river. You can't. This is as high as we could build. No matter, so if we wanted more floors, we had to have smaller people. <laughs> uh, it was hard to do that. So we ended uh, with this building. So the, the area is governed by the height, not by any other zoning. So if we were able to uh, get more floors, we would have. It's a very high-tech building, very much energy efficient with sun control, and has one of the great spaces in London in it for RoboBank, uh, a Dutch bank that uses this as their trading floor. Now, what's interesting about this is that these structural beams can take new floors if someday they don't want trading. But at the moment, it's one of the most beautiful spaces, fully skylighted and uh, under sun control. We did this building for Endesa headquarters. And this is the largest energy company in Madrid. Uh, and this building is almost a million square feet. Um, and they wanted a building that had an entire roof of, so of uh, s photovoltaic cell on the roof. They wanted to produce half their energy from the sun. Unfortunately. When they discovered the cost <laughs> versus what they t got in energy, they have postponed. Uh, so this putting that so this roof is now a glass roof uh, over the atrium spaces, and unfortunately, uh, will be a while before they. Uh, by the way, that canopy was 90 feet. Uh, I don't like to stand under it, but uh, no. okay. This is kind of the space that's created between buildings. Fascinating building in Japan. Mr. Mori, uh, one of the great um, developers, period, uh, asked us to do a new city within a city called Rapungi Hills. 
Mr. Mari's father was a marvelous professor of economics who bought uh, all the properties in downtown Tokyo, it seemed, and was worth $17.5 billion when we began to pursue him. Now, I decided that if he would adopt me, I would prefer that <laughs> to giving us a job. But we didn't get the, I got the job, not the adoption. This building is unique, and it's uh, 60,000 square foot floor plates, big. And I argued with Mr. Moore, I said we should do 230, but he said, no, this will lease. So it is like the sumo wrestler. I mean, this is how you feel about this building. At the very top is a great art museum, which Tom Krenz of the Guggenheim had originally come up with the idea. It has retail offices. I won't go through all of it, because it'll take too much time. But these are the typical floors of this building. I teach this at business school as well as a case, because the top floors earn no money but they're for culture, they're for education. And Mr. Mari felt so strongly about his, his people and his city, he wanted to uh, do that. This is the shopping, which is quite interesting, and the movie theater uh, with a very beautiful wall that we've done. So, hotel is the Grand Hyatt I recommended for anybody who wants to stay in a fabulous hotel in Japan, and uh, you can shop. I'm gonna move quickly. We do a lot of corporate headquarters, and this was Gannett USA Today, where these two buildings create a great space, which is landscaped with many rooms where you can uh, sit out and, and enjoy the space and have meetings. And uh, one of the great features is this stair, which leads to the newsroom, but it's like a piece of art. And the exterior wall is made up of these glass fins that when it, the sun hits it, it looks like a rainbow across the building. So it's quite beautiful. First casino at Mohican Sun. If anybody wants to gamble, this is one of the best places to go. It's in Connecticut, um, and uh, this is the top. This was one of the only, I think, casinos to win any awards architecturally. Uh, schools in Wharton in, in Philadelphia. We did uh, their new John Huntsman Hall. I show you this because this is the key space. This space, all the students from around the campus come to uh, enjoy, and. Uh, the intermingle with faculty and students has been very successful. And uh, we were doing work at the University of Washington uh, for Bill Gates in honor of his father. Uh, and um, then this project um, came along, which was great. We competed for a building called the Espirito Santos Building in Miami. And I think on CSI Miami, you can see this building many times. So uh, it's a wonderful building. It was to be the gateway to uh, Miami, or to South America, and it has this wonderful arch, this very soft arch, that makes it uh, a really special building. It's mixed use with office, hotel, and residential. And uh, now, finally, the millennium. Things started to really change for us with the millennium. We now were growing, we were in all these places, but now we started to grow in the Mideast, far more in China, and uh, the office was expanding. This was our first building in Abu Dhabi, which is still considered the best building there um, for the a a Adia Investment Group. And in Japan, uh, for, Morgan, for Merrill Lynch, their new corporate headquarters, and a uh, very special building. I won't go into all the details, but 55-foot spans for their typical floor works extremely well for uh, uh, trading. Now, this is a unique building for us, a small building a factory that makes robots. And we treated it, uh, the key was to create a landscape uh, uh, for the roof. And so you arrive in this very beautiful ramped landscape leading into a small structure where there are conference rooms and sales rooms and uh, great views. Um, you see it day and night, very special. But this is the, where they make the robots. And these robots are made for any given industry, and they're pretty amazing when you're down there. So we're trying to get a few for our office. Uh. Okay, for you in, in, in Michigan, University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, Steve Ross uh, very generously gave the money to build the Ross Business School, which uh, we're extremely proud of. Uh, using terracotta, uh, brick, and glass, uh, have created a, a marvelous, uh, I think, school. Uh, and this great space here, uh, where the students gather has become the most popular space on the campus. Uh, the Mandarin, and I'm, I'm going to move through Las Vegas quickly, except it's one of the great lobbies in the world. You come up here overlooking Vegas and check in. Um, we do some housing that uh, we've done in New York, which is quite interesting. I won't. And uh, 
this building is, we, we, we're very involved with energy at this point and conservation of energy and sustainability. So this building in Toronto has the great sunshades, uh, light shelf, air distributed from the floor up. It's a, truly a very efficient building and, and it's got the highest rating for sustainability. And that's a typical office. Now, we do small buildings. A few years, two years ago, things were so bad in the States, there were no projects. A client came to me and said, I have this little building, I'm going to show you, on the left. See that one there? That's the building. He says, we want to add 25,000 square feet and redo it. What do you think you can do? So, going back one, um, there's what we did. And added 25,000 square feet, changed the whole building, and it's now in construction. It's leased and it's a, a big hit. So. Even little buildings can be big successes. And I'll mention Unilever. I, I think I, I may actually end on this. Uh, Unilever um, is a fabulous, this building was built in 1920, and this facade is landmarked. And it faces the city of London, it's in London. So it was traditional, you entered through this great arch, but we gutted it totally and created an interior that is both vertically and horizontally transparent and interactive. And uh, this was before, and this is now. When you come up here, you are so excited, so inspired by light and color and views. And we took the rear wall out looking over London. It's pretty amazing. So they love this building. Just look at these views. This back wall was also brick and stone. We removed it so you can see the Thames and all of the great buildings around. It's pretty spectacular. And look at that view. And you, the, all the floors are open. So it's interactive visually. People see each other working. And the work environment, people don't want to go home. They don't live in places that's nice. And they really sort of stay here. And uh, take, look at, you know, looking up the atrium with sculpture, the elevators moving up and down. It's pretty spectacular. Then this lovely roof with landscaping that looks out over St. Paul and the skyline of London. And just a few, I just need to end on these. Uh, this is a building we've just finished in Hong Kong called ICC. And it's probably gotten more rave reviews. It's a series of shingles, almost like a great uh, monster <laughs> with shingles, um, that come down and take you down to uh, shopping and to transportation. And um, it's a spectacular building. It's fully leased. The interesting thing, Al, you would enjoy this too, is this building was built in phases. Morgan Stanley leased this uh, while it was being built above. Uh, Credit Suisse this, Deutsche Bank this, and the Ritz there, done in phases. So while they were building, they had tenants in the building earning fee. Now, it's very risky. You don't want to build, you know, damage. But uh, Susan Pelley, by the way, did this. We did this. These are like the gold posts on the harbor of uh, Hong Kong. <laughs> London, we're doing um, two big towers with a great fish tank. Uh, this is the Heron Tower. And the new pinnacle will be the tallest building in London. Uh, Foster's uh, building is here. Uh, I, I won't go through. Al described the success of Sango is pretty amazing. The Abu Dhabi Airport is one of our great commissions that is under construction and will be one of the superb airports in the world. Great spaces. Uh, and we're doing the media center for Abu Dhabi as well. This is newspaper, TV, radio, et cetera. In Korea, this wonderful building um, that uh, is called the Latte Tower, uh, that will be the tallest building in Seoul, uh, in Korea. As the partnership grew, we had uh, more and more work. We had to add people. And I was going to do China, but I, I think time is short. So what I want to tell you about China, you may not realize, is the size of China is the same area as the United States. Population, though, is 1.3 million to 350 million. And China is growing faster rate than we are. Uh, but China can only build on one third of its property due to desert mountains. So imagine if you put five times or four times the density of America just on one third of America. What do you think you'd have? You'd have a lot of tall buildings, and that's what you're getting. But I want, these are interesting statistics. I'd be happy to make copies for you. Because you're, what I just was going to summarize and say is that China will be the most powerful country in most any way you can think. And having the chance to work in China with Chinese clients, government officials, you come away with a respect 
for what this country will face, and you will face, your children will face, and children's children, if we don't start to come together and have policies that will take this country forward. Because China is moving forward. They have a rapid transit connecting every major city at 250 miles an hour that will be done by 2015. Every city, major city. They will have more airports, more highways, more ut infrastructure. They, uh, these are our projects, by the way. We've done over 110 million square feet of buildings. But China will have, we're doing the new airport for them in Nanning. Uh, I'm not going to take time to review all these, but uh, I, we're going to get to the end in a minute. But I just wanted to make you aware that China, between its stress on education, stress on research, stress on energy, is taking the lead in every area as well as in their military. We have got to be smarter about what we're doing. I'm uh, just showing these projects and the quality of detail, these buildings. These Chinese, everybody says, well, do they build well? Well, let me, you're looking at buildings that are absolutely beautifully constructed. The details of these wall systems, the Chinese walls we're now importing to the US. Uh, and these hotels we did uh, in Shintendi, this is where the Communist Party got started in this little area, and it's become a a uh, preserved area with restaurants, bars, et cetera. But these two hotels we just finished that are part of that environment. I'm not going to take time on these, but came to the very end. OK, this is what I wanted to show you. This was Pudang in 1990, OK? I was there in the late 80s and 90s. 1990, that's Pudang, all right? So uh, that's Pudan today, same place, 20 years later. Just think about it. What, 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 what's, what are we, we can't even get the World Trade Center up in 20, 10 years. So this, they've done all of this in 20 years. Skidmore uh, did the Jin Mao, I'm sorry. Skidmore did the Jin Mao Tower here, and we've done the Shanghai World Financial Center there, which has a wonderful hotel at the top. The restaurants, some of them are spectacular at the top of this building. The swimming pool is at the 92nd floor. And I tell you, you, you think the, and the building is not moving because that water is, that's not glass, that's water. And it's just absolutely quite amazing. At the very top of this building is a viewing platform that has glass floor, all glass, all right? You have to be very brave to step out because you are 1,600 feet in the air and looking out over if you're afraid of heights, don't go. Uh, the elevator takes one minute to get here. It's a Japanese elevator. It's pretty amazing. But this is what I'm going to end with, because the sun is setting on China, but it's also rising on China. And uh, we really need to you know, really think carefully about our future. Uh, meanwhile, as architects, working in this place has been one of the most exciting, most enjoyable. We're all over. We're in Shanghai. We're in Singapore and all through Hong Kong is, and Korea, et cetera. But China's been the most amazing place. And to see the change in 20 years is staggering. And it continues at a rapid rate all through China. So on that note, with the sun setting over the beautiful Pudang, all new in the last 20 years, um, I'd be happy to take some questions. So thank you.